good evening to all of you uh, i welcome you all for this live webinar the topic is ecg in the emergency room part 2 a case based discussion part 1 was held on 24th may you all will are aware uh, to moderate the today's webinar we have a moderator dr smith sirvasto dr smith sirvasto is md pg dm hhm and dm he is associate professor and head of department of cardiology he is he is uh, attached with advanced cardiac institute pandit jawahar lal nehru memorial medical college raipur chatisgarh he is winner of national gold medal for best paper at jericon 2009 he is fellow of american college of cardiology he is fellow of international medicine science academy he is fellow of indian society of electrocardiology he has number of patients in indian heart journal journal of indian clinical and applied medicine so i welcome you sir thank you uh, our uh, today's speak we have two speaker today in this webinar the first one is dr javed parvesh is a md and dm he is a consultant cardiologist cardiac electrophysiologist attached with ramkrishna care hospital raipur chatisgarh he is post graduate post doctoral fellowship in cardiac electrophysiology and pacing from jaydeva institute of cardiac sciences bangalore he is a gold he has got a gold medal in general medicine from jjm medical college he has authored numerous national and international publications in accredited journals it's a regular speaker at national and state conferences and has keen interest in arrhythmia interpretation and ablation and cardiac device implantation and intervention the topic his topic of today is 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 a focus on crucial clues adding clinical diagnosis our second speaker so welcome you pravesh uh, javed pravesh sir now i also welcome our second uh, speaker dr sanjay pv dr sanjay pv pv is consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist attached with srm institute of medical sciences wada palani chennai tamil nadu he is a young investigator he got a young investigator award from asia pacific pcr singapore live in indian heart journal av award owner also for the best dm post graduate thesis in cardiology 2016 he has pr his presentation done in national eco conference iae madurai ihrs 2018 jaipur he has done presentation in national and international conference and has author of numerous publications the topic today with on which he will be will be speaking is interesting cases of synco so these are two speakers for today's session and moderator is dr smith sirvasto before actually i hand over the session to dr smith sirvasto uh, uh, there is a surprise for him yesterday only we celebrated birthday of dr smith sirvasto so as a token of regards from all of us uh, uh, and from our good wishes i request uh, our technical to team to play a video of just 39 second Ajay ji, very very thank you. बहुत ही it was a very beautiful presentation and uh, I think I am I am feeling that it's uh, another day that celebration continues. Uh, there is uh, before we start uh, basically even Jawed's topic is also on synco because last time most of the audiences they requested that we'll uh, we need something on synco so both of the speakers would be speaking on topic uh, for uh, on synco. So I'll request Dr. Javed to begin his presentation, and we'll learn from a lot from him, like last time we did. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, let me start sharing my slides. 
okay uh, i think the slides are visible okay so yeah. before beginning i must thank dr smith uh, and dr sanjay the, uh, for uh, for joining me on this presentation and uh, despite we had uh, multiple rescheduling and uh, sanjay and dr smith both persisted with me in this endeavor to bring to you this presentation on ecg and syncope so again uh, like the last time around we have uh, we have divided into two parts the first part which i am going to be covering uh, covers lot of theoretical aspects and uh, then i'll be showing some uh, four to five interesting cases of uh, syncope where ecg was vital in uh, arriving at uh, various clinical decisions and then uh, sanjay dr sanjay will take over mm -hmm. and, and and he will show his interesting cases collection where uh, of syncope where ecg was involved so without for much further ado let us begin because uh, i have a history of overrunning my time during presentations okay so first of all a definition of syncope a transient loss of consciousness due to cerebral hypoperfusion which is characterized by rapid onset short duration and spontaneous complete resolution so uh, why i'll i'll be spending just one minute on the definition because the definition is really very very important one needs to understand that before labeling any patient with syncope we need to have complete transient loss of consciousness and we are attributing this loss of consciousness due to cerebral hypoperfusion and there are these three characteristics uh, features that is the onset is rapid and the, the the episode is of very short duration and spontaneous complete resolution if all these four are present then only you label any patient with uh, with transient loss of consciousness as having syncope and also very important to remember is that the syncope syncope is not a sympt uh, is not a diagnosis it's a symptom now uh, what are the steps in evaluation of syncope basically we'll be dealing with the uh, importance of ecg in syncope but before we go there it's uh, just it's it will be good to revise uh, how to evaluate a patient with syncope so step number 1 would be to confirm that the episode was a definite syncope so we must differentiate it from uh, syncope mimics syncope like events which were not syncope and uh, i'll come to that and history so as uh, as i will show in subsequent slides out of all the things available to us to come to a diagnosis in a case of syncope history has an yield of almost 30 to 40% so as i uh, as i uh, as from my experience that i i am running a syncope clinic in my hospital here uh, we need to de devote at least to find out what were the precipitating factors what was the patient doing at the time of uh, syncope uh, what was his uh, uh, what was uh, were there any triggers and uh, were there any medications which were responsible what was the situation like and how were his limb positions uh, at the time of syncope was there any uh, in involuntary movements or involuntary loss of uh, urine or uh, or tongue bite all those things are very very important so it is of utmost importance in every patient with syncope that we tend to you know devote some time to history then similarly physical examination e ecg all the efforts in any patients with syncope are devoted to basically to find out whether the syncope is malignant or not or whether we are dealing with a structural heart disease or neurological disease or not and when it comes to ecg our all efforts are devoted to find out whether the patient has a structural heart disease or not then further guided by our history and physical examination we go for further tests uh, which can be neuroimaging to echocardiography depending upon case based scenarios and then comes after you know basic evaluation we still don't have any diagnosis so we label it as unexplained syncope and then it becomes a specialized field and then we need to consider specialized tests like maybe tilt table test and the implantable loop recorder we'll see the ut utility of all in subsequent slides so now as a, as i was saying that we need to differentiate syncope from syncope mimics so if you have a complete loss of consciousness loss of postural tone and very rapid onset of transient loss of consciousness and complete spontaneous recovery then we are very highly likely that you are dealing with syncope while uh, there are certain similar sort of episodes where there is no loss of consciousness for example a tia of carotid origin uh, uh, falls or uh, cataplexy there we don't have impairment in consciousness and when we cannot differentiate just based on the history then probably we should not label the event as syncope or you can label it as very syncope or label it as just simple falls so that it becomes easy for subsequent evaluation 
Similarly, you have metabolic disorders like hypoglycemia, uh, electrolyte imbalances, hypoxia, where you have partial or complete LOC without uh, global hypoperfusion. So we have LOC, but you are not attributing this loss of consciousness to global hypoperfusion. Once again, you should not label these patients as syncope. Now, uh, uh, most important differentiation is between seizure and syncope. This is a common uh, problem that we need, uh, that uh, everyone faces. So very, uh, there are a lot of uh, different things from which we can come to, a, uh, come to a differentiation, whether the episode was a seizure or a syncope. Uh, all of these things are common and known to everyone. What I would like to highlight is usually uh, you will have a uh, prodrome, which will be longer in seizure. And the prodrome of a seizure is different from a prodrome of a vasovagal syncope. Then comes loss of consciousness. It is very important to understand that uh, you can have certain tonic clonic movements or convulsive uh, posturing even during vasovagal syncope or cardiac syncope. The difference here is that the convulsive episodes or the convulsive movements occur after loss of consciousness, uh, consciousness has occurred in patients with vasovagal syncope or cardiac syncope. While in patients with seizures, the usually loss of consciousness is delayed. First comes the seizure or it is simultaneously with the seizure as well as uh, the uh, tonic clonic movements. So it is not uncommon to have tonic clonic movements during syncope. And these sort of patients are called as convulsive syncope. So it's very important to differentiate these two. Then uh, all those things like uh, tongue bite, again, it's an uh, important point that tongue bite is rarely seen. Uh, almost I see 100 patients of syncope in a year. And I have rarely seen a patient with tongue bite uh, with, uh, you know, patient of seizure with tongue bite. Similarly, incontinence, again, it can be seen with uh, syncope as well as seizure. So it's not very helpful to dif differentiate. Uh, similarly, the color of the skin, which is pale and postictal state. Usually the postictal state in patients with the syncope is very short and the recovery is very fast. But in elderly patients, even with vasovagal syncope, it may take hours to, you know, have a complete recovery. Uh, just a moment uh, with pathophysiological basis of classi uh, classification of syncope. So the syncope can be of three major types. One is reflex syncope, cardiac syncope, and the syncope secondary to orthostatic hypertension. At the heart of syncope lies global cerebral hypoperfusion, as I've underlined earlier. Then you can have in cardiac causes of syncope, arrhythmias or structural heart disease, where you can have low cardiac output, basically contributing to low blood pressure and cerebral hypoperfusion. While in reflex syncope, all the cardiovascular reflexes which are responsible to maintain cardiac output and blood pressure and cerebral per perfusion are defective. So you can have a vasodepressor kind of response where sympathetics are involved and you can have a cardio inhibitory type of res uh, response where the basically parasympathetics are involved and bradycardia asystole are the common presentations. Then you can have syncope secondary to orthostatic hypertension. Again, uh, it is because of either structural damage to the neuro, uh, autonomic neuro, uh, system, nervous system, or you can have the damage which is because of drug induced. So again, uh, the, uh, the causes of syncope are usually neurally mediated, orthostatic, arrhythmias, and cardiac structural pulmonary. Out of these, the most common one is neurally mediated, accounting for almost 40% of the cases. Then cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac structure, cardio, uh, structural cardiac pulmonary uh, problems almost contribute to 10 to 15, 20% of the cases. But it is very important to recognize these 10 to 20% of the patients because these are the cases of usually malignant syncope where the chances of loss of life are much more rather than in a new, uh, new reflex syncope. So there are certain red flag signs. If you have any of these signs during any point in evaluation of syncope, you should either uh, give more importance to the patient and you should probably uh, do an evaluation in an inpatient setting. So if you have structural abnormalities like low ejection fraction, uh, decompensated heart failure, prior myocardial infarction. Now this is very, very important, prior myocardial infarction. In a patient who has history of uh, documented coronary artery disease, if there is a documented syncope, you must assume that this syncope was because of VT or VF until unless proved otherwise. I have seen numerous occasions and numerous cases where a patient who had underwent angioplasty and was shifted out from the ICU, had a syncope and was discharged and then brought in dead, you know, with sudden cardiac death. So probably that syncope is the only syncope or three syncope is the only uh, initial red flag sign which can tell us that this patient is likely to have arrhythmia. So prior myocardial infarction, uh, with syncope should be given paramount importance. Then if you have a syncope during exertion, it should be given very utmost importance 
usually it is seen in outflow tract obstructions or can be seen in cpvt or some forms of lqt as well uh, syncope while supine so most of the cases of reflex syncope are usually uh, seen in standing position so if you have syncope while supine position you should give it much more importance if there is history of sudden cardiac death and of course if there are ecg abnormalities uh, anemia electrolyte derangement adding to that if there is history of uh, uh, history of fall or trauma significant trauma to the patient in any of these episodes then probably it should be considered as a red flag sign and if the patient doesn't have any pre monetary symptoms or he cannot prevent a syncope then it should be given much more importance now coming to the topic today that is ecg in syncope again there are lot of findings on ecg and syncope which can help us to arrive at the conclusion of cause of syncope starting from rhythm abnormalities abnormalities of av conduction wpw syndrome uh, which reflect usually in the pr interval this part of the segment then the qrs can tell us a lot of things about structural abnormalities then comes the st segment which can tell us about ischemia certain channel opathies then repolarization abnormalities like lqt and so on and so forth so if you just remember uh, just pqrs t uh, this is just to give us a uh, remember better what are the causes of syncope which can be found out on ecg so from the rhythm point of view first thing is sinus node and sinus node dysfunction again sinus node dysfunction uh, to prove the patient has sinus node dysfunction is not very difficult if you have a documented sinus bradycardia which is uh, inappropriate for the physiological circumstances and the, uh, the bradycardia is persistent and is not caused by drugs or any uh, correctable causes then you have proved that patient has sinus node dysfunction the difficulty lies where when the patient presents to us with syncope and we cannot demonstrate a significant uh, sinus pause or sinus uh, sinus arrest and we just have sinus bradycardia so in these patients uh, syncope is a common presentation of sick sinus syndrome but the onus lies on the physician to prove that the syncope was clearly because of sinus arrest or pause uh, just having sinus bradycardia on ecg and uh, syncope you know uh, doesn't put put together 2 plus 2 is 4 and doesn't give us a conclusive evidence that uh, sinus node dysfunction is cause of syncope so again other other manifestation of sinus node dysfunction can be tachybrady syndrome where you have alternating paroxysms of rapid regular or irregular atrial tachycardias or and slower uh, atrial or ventricular rates so this is an example of uh, sick sinus uh, syndrome here you can see we have an irregular narrow complex tachycardia most probably a multifocal atrial tachycardia and you have a long pause the pause is almost 5 seconds so if this patient presents to us with syncope you can you know directly go for a definitive therapy in forms of uh, pacemaker as well as antiarrhythmic drugs because we now we know that 5 second pause can cause syncope suppose you have only 2 second pause or uh, 1.5 to 2 second pause and the patient presents to you with syncope then we need much more evidence to say that the patient has uh, uh, symptomatic sinus node dysfunction and the uh, syncope was because of sinus pause so again the same things i have highlighted again in patients with syncope and sinus bradycardia and sinus node dysfunction a symptom to finding correlation is a must the onus to prove that the syncope was because of sinus arrest or pause lies on the physician so you have to do prolonged monitoring and uh, that is the best way to you know prove these patients that the syncope is clearly because of sinus node dysfunction uh, in patients with sinus node dysfunction electrophysiological study have very limited role because most of the clinical decisions can be made by routine testing and uh, the, on electrophysiological testing you can confirm that the patient has sinus node dysfunction but you cannot produce a pause so it is difficult so one must remember before uh, labeling something as pause on ecg that if there are a hidden pacs which are non conducted or if you have 2 is to 1 av block as you can see on this ecg it looks like a clear cut 2 is to 1 av block on holter but when we did a electrophysiological study for this patient what we found out was that there were junctional ectopics and these junctional ectopics were uh, getting conducted into the av uh, av node retrograde concealed conduction and causing the less next sinus bit not to be conducted so you see here so these are these are the a waves uh, a waves that is atrial contraction so a is synonymous for p wave on the egm so this is the p atrial activation then you have h here and then we have v so this beat has a h v sinus beat conducting to the ventricle next beat what happens we see here that this a 
right there is not conducted. The reason is because this H here has come earlier and this is an ectopic. Similarly, the same ectopic occurs again there. So this patient probably would require antiarrhythmic drugs rather than uh, pacemaker therapy for uh, correction of symptoms. So one must be very careful in diagnosing something as a significant cause to look for whether there are non-conducted PACs or there are concealed junctional ectopy. And how, do, how does one we know that? So you need to do prolonged monitoring. Then only such, uh, you know, such doubts will appear. And wherever doubts appear, I think the most, uh, the most useful test to do is an electrophysiological study. Now coming to AV block. Uh, we all know that uh, AV blocks can cause syncope. When, what I need to emphasize here that you all must understand that it is the paroxysmal AV block or the intermittent AV block that presents most of us uh, most commonly as syncope. If you have permanent AV block and relatively good escape rhythm and, uh, and 24 hours that complete heart block is running on and you have a certainly stable escape, that patient will not present with syncope. It is almost always paroxysmal AV block or intermittent AV block that presents to us with syncope. Then if you have two is to one AV block and with syncope, in these patients, certainly AV study has a very important role. As you all know that two is to one AV block can be vaguely mediated or in electrophysiological terms, uh, it can be suprahesian or intrahesian rather than infrahesian. So if you have a physiological or a vagal AV block, which is two is to one, uh, it is usually benign. So in these patients, electrophysiological study has certain role. Then comes bifascular or trifascular block. So if patient has a syncope, history of syncope, and you find out that the, uh, on the resting ECG, there is a trifascular block, then very likely that this patient had an intermittent high-grade AV block that had resulted in syncope. Now again, these terms tri trifascular and bifascular are usually confusing and uh, many of the authors usually avoid using these terms. Whatever is there on the ECG, we, should, we must label it as it is. That is, if you have a right bundle branch block and LAFB along with uh, first degree AV block, you mention it as all three. This is the most common combination where you get a tri incomplete sort of trifascular AV block where you have right bundle branch, left anterior fascicular block and a first degree AV block. So also along with that, you can have a second degree AV block. So if you have a second degree AV block with a bifascular block, chances of this being an infra block is much more common. So this is an example of a um, first degree AV block is there. Then you have right bundle branch block and you have LAHB. So if this patient presents to syncope, more likely that the syncope was because of a high grade AV block. Now what about left bundle branch block? So this patient presents to you with syncope. So you have a... Uh, left bundle branch block, sinus rhythm, one is to one AV conduction, the PR interval looks normal. So what are you going to do? Is there any role of electrophysiological study here? Definitely after further evaluation, if you cannot find any significant cause of syncope and you think AV conduction abnormality is, is involved or AV conduction is responsible for the syncope, then you must subject these patients for electrophysiological test. So specifically, if you have HV interval in these patients more than 200 or you have uh, AV block at cycles more than uh, 400 pacing le cycle length, then these patients should, uh, you know, would go for a pacemaker. Uh, what about this? So this is nothing but short PR interval and delta waves, and this is a WPW syndrome. A patient who has this pre-excitation on baseline ECG and presents to us with syncope should be given paramount importance. Most commonly, these patients would have had an, an episode of atrial fibrillation with uh, pre-excitation, that is a pre-excited AFib that would have caused a syncope in these patients and there is a risk of sudden cardiac death in this patient. So we should, this is not benign and all these patients should be taken very seriously. What about supraventricular tachycardias? Supraventricular tachycardias usually do not produce syncope. Exceptions are if you have atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation with pre-excitation, they usually cause syncope or if there is baseline LV dysfunction, then these patients can cause syncope. Ventricular tachycardias, we all know that they can produce syncope. Now, what about PVCs? So, patient had a syncope and on, on the baseline ECG, we found out PVCs. So, what is the significance of them? So, if you have pleomorphic or polymorphic PVCs, that is uh, PVCs which are of changing morphology or multiple morphology, they indicate the presence of structural heart disease. If polymorphic PVCs are present, more likely that patient had a ventricular arrhythmia and that had caused the syncope. Also, if you have R on T PVC, they can produce polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, especially in the setting of acute ischemia, hypokalemia, 
and congenital long QT syndrome. If the PVCs are interpolated, that is, that is that they are not followed by a pause or they come just in between of the two RR intervals, they are more commonly associated with PVC induced cardiomyopathy, that is heart failure just because of PVC. Then if there are short coupled PVCs, especially Purkinje PVCs, they can produce idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. So if any patient of syncope has a, a PVC in the baseline ECG, it should be given paramount importance. Now have a look at this ECG. Uh, this is from a young patient who presented to us with multiple episodes of syncope. And you see the baseline ECG is almost normal. You have an RSR dash pattern in B1. Other than that, there is no significant abnormalities. Some ST segment flattening in 2-3 AVF, nothing much. But multiple episodes and on prolonged monitoring, uh, this is on an implantable loop recorder. What we could find out that there was a PVC. You can see here, this is the PVC right there, which has triggered a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia here, and it was producing syncope. So again, an important point that uh, longer you record the, in these patients with unexperienced syncope, you will be able to obtain a diagnosis. Then coming to ischemia, have a look at this ECG. Uh, there is ST elevation in AVR, and uh, I think previous uh, presentations you would you would have seen the ECG. It's a very important ECG. That's why I keep showing it again and again. So you can uh, this patient presented to us with chest pain and syncope, and you had a, an anterior wall MI with ST elevation in AVR and V1 to V4. So a proximal LED or an LMCA uh, occlusion, and then you can see uh, that a PVC appeared here or an R on T phenomenon that triggered a torsades. So Again, ECG finding was very important. That is ST elevation in AVR. So now again, look, have a look at this ECG. This also, this is also from a patient who presented with history of syncope. So what we can see is that uh, it does mimic, uh, it does look like uh, LMCA occlusion type of pattern. You have AVR ST elevation, which is more than V1. And on the other leads, you don't have much ST elevation, but you have ST depression in uh, V4 to V6. So this is kind of a mimicking pattern, which is, it is not significant here because the baseline rhythm is not sinus. If you can see here in V2, basically this patient is having flutter. So in presence of tachycardia, the findings which I have shown just earlier in the previous ECG of LMC occlusion, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't stand that significant ground. So basically this patient had three to one atrial flutter and the LMC occlusion pattern was mimicking uh, because uh, it was because of atrial flutter and not in sinus rhythm. Now again, there are certain pointers in ECG which point towards structural heart disease. So what are those? If you have pathological Q waves, so that indicates a scar. And if that patient presents with syncope, more likely that he had a ventricular arrhythmia. Then comes fragmented QRS. So fragmented QRS is this slurring which you can see here. If you have this kind of slurring at the end of QRS, or just prior to the end of QRS, or you have notched S waves, or you have notched R waves, and you have RSR dash with ST elevation, all of these come together uh, in fragmented QRS. So if you have fragmented QRS in baseline ECG, that indicates you have a scar. And this fragmentation is because of slow conduction in those areas. So uh, once again, it, uh, ECG itself will tell you that the patient has a scar, and that is the reason of a uh, syncope in these patients. Then you have intraventricular conduction delays, left bundle branch blocks, epsilon waves, and left ventricular hypertrophy. So especially IVCD and left bundle branch block, if they are present in the ECG, most likely the patient has structural heart disease and the cause of syncope was cardiac arrhythmia, most likely. So have a look at this ECG in a patient who presented to us with syncope. So what you can see is uh, based, rhythm is sinus, one is to one AV conduction, PR is normal. You have incomplete, uh, you have RVV-like pattern here. You have R wave in V1. And what else you have is a slurred uh, fragmentation at the end of QRS, which is nothing but epsilon wave. You have T wave inversion precordial leads. So this is nothing but ARVC. Now in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Again, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can have syncope because of two reasons. One is because of scar, which can produce arrhythmia. The other is LVOT obstruction. So have a look at this ECG, where you can see uh, there is left ventricular hypertrophy, very high voltages. And what you see here is there is a uh, pathological deep Q waves in one AVL V5, V6. You see how deep these Q waves are. So they indicate uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
so this sort of pattern is less commonly seen in india we see much more common pattern is that is of t wave inversion lvh with strain pattern that is known as and uh, but even this pattern if you have you have a diagnosis of a structural heart disease so this is the pattern which is commonly seen in india that is uh, apical hcm uh, you have uh, these t inversions t wave inversions in precordial leads and left ventricular hypertrophy then certain inherited arrhythmia syndromes also you can pick these on ecg that is long qt syndrome short qt syndrome brigada syndrome and uh, cpvt so we'll see the examples of each so this is a patient with uh, multiple episodes of syncope and is a young patient what is striking here is that the qt interval is very much prolonged and also if you see in v1 you see that t wave alternance that in every alternate beat the t wave morphology is changing a very high predictor for a trossard so uh, long qt syndrome is basically channelopathy uh, it sometimes it involves potassium channels sometimes it involves uh, less commonly it involves sodium channels and uh, even the morphology of qt interval and t wave can tell you what subtype it is but the most important thing to recognize is to identify the long qt interval then similarly if you have short qt syndrome have a look at this ecg the qt interval is very very short here lesser than 360 milliseconds and if you have short qt and the syncope most commonly the diagnosis is uh, congenital sqts and uh, and the arrhythmia seen here is polymorphic vtvf then you have brugada syndrome which is commonly diagnosable on ecg and uh, basically you have a right bundle branch block type pattern and you have st segment elevation which is cove type in type 1 saddle back type in type 2 and in both these two types uh, the st elevation is more than 10, 10 mm if it is less than 10 mm it is type 3 so if you have syncope with brugada pattern most commonly again uh, the arrhythmia would be polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and it should be taken very significantly now cpvt cpvt is also a disease inherited channelopathy and uh, most commonly the syncope here is exertional and the tmt is diagnostic here so what we see on tmt in these patient is uh, not only we can reproducibly induce syncope and initially we have a bigeminal sort of uh, pvc pattern so that so the when exercise starts the pvc starts appearing and as the exercises progresses the pvc is become in bigeminal fashion and then you can have a bidirectional vt or a polymorphic vt so in this patient as you can see as the exercise progressed these pvcs became uh, became much more frequent and one of those pvcs has triggered a uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia so as uh as i am doing this uh, test that is ilr and uh, head up tilt table testing i run a synco clinic here it is important i thought it is important to discuss about tilt table testing so tilt table testing is very important in patients with unexplained syncope so this is not a very uh, you know uh, sort of a sophisticated test it's a very simple test can be performed anywhere all you need is a tilt table table like this and you should have some sort of protection so that if the patient develops syncope he should not fall down and you need a, you need to have a defibrillator stand by because many of the times patient develops vfib also and we need to give a shock so commonly uh, what are the uses of uh, tilt table testing the tilt table testing is required only in patients who have atypical vasovagal syncope so if you have typical vasovagal syncope clearly identifiable triggers and the history is clearly suggestive that the syncope is vasovagal uh, tilt table testing is not indicated a uh, tilt table testing is only indicated when the vasovagal syncope seems atypical so that uh, what does atypical mean here atypical means that the symptoms uh, the, there there is no clear cut identifiable trigger the symptoms are occurring in supine position as well and the recovery takes longer so these are labeled as atypical vasovagal syncope to confirm that this is vasovagal syncope you can do a tilt table syncope so that uh, you know many of the times patient has recurrent falls so to assess the syncope severity you can do a tilt table test you, there you can find out uh, whether the patient is having vasodepressor type of response or cardio inhibitory then if you have syncope of unknown etiology also you can do a tilt table test here the value is additive if you elicit a positive response then it is suggestive of a vasovagal syncope but not diagnostic then the patients who have diagnosed vasovagal syncope there is something known as tilt training so you need to train these patients to avoid uh, having this syncope and what is the response of tilt training also can be assessed on tilt table testing so this is one of our patients uh, who was having a young female 
was having uh, multiple episodes of syncope was diagnosed as epilepsy started on anti epileptic medications this is during tilt table testing you can see in the tilted up position the patient is unconscious and the characteristic sign is that as soon as the, you make the patient lie down within 20 seconds there is recovery of consciousness so that is diagnostic of uh, reflex syncope or vasovagal syncope one just one slide about the implantable loop recorder uh, so you can see the yield of ecg so the longer you record more are uh, more likely you are uh, that you will become able you will be able to come to a diagnosis so 12 lead ecg is basically record of 10 seconds majorly holter monitoring at the max 2 days event recorder can do a recording up to 7 to 30 days while an ilr can do a recording up to 3 years so if you have a patient who has very infrequent symptoms but the symptoms are malignant that is the patient had significant injuries with syncope and uh, there is no other diagnosis diagnosis suggested by previous test then you can recommend the patient for a loop recorder as i was saying earlier that this is the diagnostic yield of various things that are available at our disposal so as you can see history and physical examination if done carefully and done nicely alone you can come to a diagnosis in these patient by 30 to 40% uh, while if you see the diagnostic yield of ilr is 43 to 88% so the longer you record the longer you look for you will be able to find a cause and this is how the ilr looks on a ec uh, on a chest x ray this is just a small thing uh, which is smaller maybe uh, smaller to the size of a shaving blade and it is done under local anesthesia very simple procedure easy to do so nothing much to be worried about uh, so with that backdrop i think we can go on to the cases of syncope that i have to show today and uh, once again uh, as these cases will have some sort of history preceding them and an interesting ecg and there will be a question uh, so that uh, you know and there will be a poll running along with the question so you can opt for the options whatever you think we'll wait for 10 to 20 seconds to see the result and then we'll discuss the ecg and uh, there will be a lot of questions by dr sanjay so you will be well waiting afterwards whether uh, you have been attentive to my session or not so starting with case number 1 so have a look at this ecg this is from a 58 year old female Uh, she had a pacemaker implanted which is a single chamber pacemaker implanted 5 years back she had lv dysfunction the cause was probably rheumatic heart disease she had some mr and she was on medical treatment for uh, heart failure and uh, she has recurrent syncope since last 2 days so uh, she was on diuretics as well so what happened just let me go back yeah so these are the options uh, so how will you approach Uh, this patient based on the light of the findings of this ecg that uh, what you would like to do a pacemaker checkup for this patient this is probably device malfunction or you like to think uh, yeah this is definitely malfunction let's put a temporary pacemaker inside or you like to give iv magnesium to this patient have a look at this ecg the poll i think has already started and uh, in between we'll discuss the ecg and after 20 seconds maybe you can have the results okay so what does the ecg show the ecg shows the uh, paced rhythm as you can also all see that there are pacing spikes preceding all the qrs complexes but not all if you see here this is preceded by pacing spike and the qrs so this is a paced qrs paced qrs again paced qrs again paced qrs again this is also a paced qrs then you have three non paced beats okay then again a paced qrs a paced qrs then you have a pacing spike but no qrs following that and then i think the later part of the ecg is not visible it doesn't matter anyways you by this only you should be able to come to a conclusion so is 20 seconds over i think yeah 20 seconds are over and uh, i think most of we uh, voted for pacemaker check device malfunction okay unfortunately so this we'll happened uh, bit in details more yes yes definitely and this is from this ecg comes from our alma mater that is jaydeva and uh, the the importance of this i'll show you in couple of slides so basically even the residents uh, who were managing this patient thought the same that this is pacing malfunction the reason was this that this pacing spike was not followed by a qrs so they all thought that this is pacing malfunction but this is in fact something much more dangerous than that so what i've done is i've just uh, zoomed the image so that we can have a good look at the qrs and, and the intervals so if we just try to attempt to make a calculation of qt interval in this patient so this is the onset of the qrs there this is the end of t wave and you have to take an rr interval which is preceding to this qt 
So if, if you make this measurement and you calculate the QTC, the QTC comes to around 626 milliseconds. So basically, our, the patient had long QT syndrome, uh, long QT, which was probably acquired because of diuretics, and uh, the QTC was very much prolonged. And the, uh, the formula for QT interval calculation, I think we have discussed in multiple such events, is easily available. And this is the importance. You see, if I go back to the previous ECG, you can see the time here. The time is 5, uh, five 9 in the morning. And the, these residents thought that probably this was facing malfunction, which was basically physiological non-capture because of under-sensing. So these three bits which you see here are nothing but a non-sustained VT run. And this is a pleomorphic VT. You can see the morphology is changing here. So this is in AVF, this is inferiorly directed. The next bit is superiorly directed. The next bit is again inferiorly directed. So at least pleomorphic uh, NSVT run is there. And because these pleomorphic bits have a, shorter you know amplitude so many of the times pacemaker fails to sense this so that's what happened this pvc was not sensed by the pacemaker which is functional under sensing and pvc and then the pacemaker tried to pace here and the, it did not capture because it is occurring at the end of a uh, t wave of the pvc and basically the syncope was here because of torch starts as you can see in the subsequent ecgs and unfortunately this patient could not be revived and this is at the 6.50 a.m. You know, so you can see within two hours, the patient landed up in refractory VF and could not be revived. And probably the correct response was to give IV magnesium. So in any such patient, if you see a prolonged QT interval and syncope, history of syncope, the first thing you should do is administer magnesium. Don't do anything other than that. First do mag give IV magnesium one gram stat, then maybe check for electrolytes. Then if you are worried about pacemaker, you can go for a pacemaker checkup as well. But if you find QT interval being prolonged and history of syncope, remember this is rule of thumb, administer magnesium at once. That is the only thing that can save the patient's life in that time. So this is just to highlight that. We'll move on to the next case. Okay, uh, this should be easy. So this is a 36 year old male patient with history of fever and syncope during fever. And uh, echo was normal. Have a look at this good look at this ECG. You can start the poll now. And so, your options are uh, whether you want to activate the cath lab, you think this is uh, acute coronary syndrome. Uh, and the second option is elect correct electrolytes. Uh, so, you think this is probably hyperkalemia or some sort of dyselectrolemia. Uh, then, the third option is refer for an ICD. Uh, D would be a refer for a genetic analysis. So we'll wait for 20 more seconds. Until that time, I'd, what I'll do is I'll try to describe the ECG, what all things are seen. So this is basically sinus rhythm, one is to one AV conduction. And uh, what abnormalities we can notice clearly is some sort of ST depression in 2, 3 AVF and ST elevation in V1 to V3. And this is con going upwards type of ST segment elevation. Some ST segment elevation is also seen in AVR. So based on the light of these findings, what do you think it is? Do we have the results, sir? Okay, let them have a good look at this because I've already shown this. This should be easy, I believe. So, no one is objected for, uh, has opted for genetic analysis. But everyone is for, 66% uh, uh, is for correct electrolyte and 33 is for AICD. Okay, so that is the effect of, I think, Sanjay's previous talk on ECG and electrolytes. That's what I believe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this is nothing but the Brugada, uh, Brugada syndrome ECG. And uh, the option here is uh, because just now previous slides have shown this is ECG pattern recognition. There is nothing much to explain there. You know, uh, if you see this pattern, you have remembered this by heart. Uh, so you can, you will be able to easily recognize this. So this is coving type of ST segment elevation more than 10 uh, in V1 to V2. So this is type one Brugada pattern. This is a patient who is young and the syncope occurred in a febrile episode. So uh, as I'll show you in the subsequent slides that even with this ECG and this history, we can clearly come to the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. We don't need a genetic analysis. So I've just put that uh, there to confuse, uh, but <laughs> none of them opted for that. So clearly you can go with this ECG and this much history, you can refer this patient for an IP. So Brugada syndrome, is a documented ventricular fibrillation or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with the family history of sudden cardiac death or cove type ECG in family members 
or if there is a inducible vt with program electrical stimulation or history of syncope or history of nocturnal agonal respiration so if you have all this or any one of these with the ecg pattern which we saw there you have a clear cut diagnosis of brugada syndrome you don't need a genetic analysis and brugada syndrome is diagnosed when type 1 st elevation is observed after spontaneously or after either intravenous administration of a sodium channel blocker that is flaconide in at least one right precordial lead placed in standard or superior position without requiring any further evidence of malignant erythema so the that's what the ecg is a pattern i have previously described uh, this is a sodium channelopathy so basically what happens is there is a change in dispersal of uh, change in uh, change in uh, dispersal uh, in between the epicardium to the uh, endocardium and that leads to you know uh, type 3 reentry and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and you can see the uh, this brugada clear cut brugada pattern there so many of the times i uh, get a lot of ecgs with lot of physicians asking me whether this is brugada or that is brugada or not so i would like all of you to take a snapshot of the, this slide and keep it with you so uh, because there is nothing much to be described or to be you know explained here so this is a pattern recognition and most commonly this is confused with a partial in a partial rbvp or an incomplete rbvp so this ecg clearly shows uh, that if you take into consideration st segment in v1 to v3 and we even just based on that you can come to a clear cut conclusion whether the ecg is fitting into brugada pattern or it is partial rbvb or it fits into a right ventricular hypothesis uh, arvc ecg now coming to third ecg now this is going to be interesting this is probably i think most interesting case uh, that we are going to uh, see today so pay close attention so this is from a 60 year old male patient with history of recurrent syncope most of the episodes during sitting position and not associated with perspiration or palpitation of late the patient had noticed episodes while eating food and resting ecg is normal and 2d echo is normal so the patient has normal lg systolic function so i'll just summarize the history so there is an elderly gentleman with history of recurrent syncope and most episodes are occurring in sitting position not in supine position and uh, the symptoms appear to be atypical for a vasovagal syncope so that he doesn't have perspiration he doesn't have palpitations as well so we don't think that there is a tachyarrhythmia going on but we still need to confirm and uh, something very characteristic which he mentions that uh, there are episodes while eating food and resting ecg is normal now we i'll show you a couple of videos i have a good look at them so this is the gentleman again this is case uh, which is cut by dr neeraj uh, who is my senior from jadeva so have a look at this ecg the this patient was in the emergency er and we asked him to swallow a cup of uh, water in front of us and we just connected a you know simple monitor and we'll have a look at the what is happening so this is the patient swallowing there and now i'll zoom into the uh, the monitor what the monitor is showing so this is just the monitor we have cut out the patient okay have a look what happens when the patient swallows so i think whatever happened was clearly visible again have a look at it once again so this is happening recurrently with swallowing so you can start the poll now so the questions for this case would be uh, this is an uh, this case demonstrated that this is a typical vasovagal syncope and the treatment would be lifestyle modification and beta blockers uh, the second option would be that this is atypical vasovagal syncope treat with a pacemaker third option would be it's a reflex syncope it's not a vasovagal syncope it's a reflex syncope treat with a pacemaker you can start the poll now uh it's uh, again 50% for option third option reflex synco which needs treatment with pacemaker and the others are 25 25% okay so i think they have got this absolutely right i'll go back to the video and show it once again so what happened is nothing but uh, the, that the patient while deglutition was showing that there were periods of asystole long pause sinus arrest or long pause so this is just with swallowing water so you can imagine what will happen if we face if the patient takes a larger meal or a larger solid meal and he was having recurrent symptoms so this is nothing but deglutition syncope which is a form of reflex syncope so like reflex syncope other examples would be cough induced syncope micturition syncope 
so all those examples are very clear to us and like in vasovagal syncope if you have clear triggers like uh, emotional stimuli or a stimuli of pain or a sight of blood as commonly happens in uh, you know medical training that when you they, when many of the patients uh, when any of the students see blood and they faint so common faint is vasovagal syncope and uh, reflex syncope examples would be as i said after a prolonged bout of uh, violent cough many of times patient tend to faint so in that case you need to treat the cough and in micturition syncope you basically uh, try to relieve any obstruction which is there and then you try to ask the patient to change certain life uh, change in lifestyle that is uh, try to pass urine in sitting position how do you solve this problem whether uh, when the patient is having syncope while deglutition so you cannot ask the patient not to have food so the answer here is to put a pacemaker inside so this is the correct answer word reflex syncope and the treatment would be with a pacemaker so what does the pacemaker do uh, if you simply put a pacemaker in, during that pause or during that pause period of sinus arrest there will be definitely atrial pacing at lower rates and also in certain other uh, certain other uh, pacemakers like uh, many of the pacemakers with metronic has this that is rate drop response so in many patients who have this we uh, have recurrent symptoms and vaguely mediated bradycardia as where there is sudden decline in rate so the pacemaker tends to protect against sudden decline in rate so you, the typical response of sinus node is to exertion or to exercise is gradual acceleration or gradual deceleration that's how you define sinus tachycardia that it has a gradual onset and a gradual offset so while if the sinus node is diseased or if there is vagal hypotonia uh, that gradual response goes away and you can have you know sudden dro sudden drops of heart rate from 70 80 to maybe 40 and that causes symptom during those periods so in in so pacemaker can sort of prevent that rate drop response as you can see here uh, this is sinus rhythm going on a sense v pace a sense v pace here there is a sinus bradycardia then sinus a pause so there was one pace one beat paced atrial pacing as well as ventricular pacing at lower rate as the pacemaker recognized that there is a loss of Uh, there is a big fall in heart rate from here to here it started pacing at faster rates so based this is based on lot of algorithms the basic purpose is to you know not to have those sudden drops to smoothen the heart rate throughout the heart rate variability throughout the day and to prevent such episodes of syncope so that patient uh, you know was saved uh, they was done is doing well with a pacemaker and she was implanted with a pacemaker with an rdr that is rate drop response and uh, that is not a common phenomena a uh, major majority of the time these reflex syncopes or uh, vagal syncopes are benign very rarely you can have these sort of patients where uh, reflex syncope or vagal syncope uh, can still have symptoms and they need to be aggressively treated uh, now fourth question uh, this is a patient with 60 year old male uh, with history of recurrent syncope uh, he, he has benign hypertrophy of prostate he is on tamsulosin plus dutasteride for that and there are no clear identifiable triggers to so basically uh, either an atypical vasovagal syncope or syncope of unknown cause and the uh, patient has normal lv function on and uh, this is the presenting ecg so in the light of this ecg uh, these are so first have a look good look at the ecg and uh, maybe after 10 seconds i'll go to the polling you can switch on the poll now so this is the presenting ecg and then these are your options so how do you approach treatment for this patient so so one of the things that you could do is uh, do a diagnostic ecg study uh, this looks like a sinus bradycardia and this syncope is because of uh, sinus bradycardia related syncope or there may be sinus arrest we don't know or this is a atypical vasovagal syncope we need to do a tilt table test to prove whether this is vasovagal or not or we can straight away go and do a permanent pacemaker Uh, what we believe that uh, pacemaker will solve this problem doctor uh, we have a full house for option 2 needs a tilt table testing <laughs> okay so i'll show the ecg again so this is the ecg maybe uh, after seeing the ecg they might change their mind okay so we'll discuss the ecg so what looks like sinus rhythm 1 is to 1 in conduction ecg is not so if you have a careful look so if you have if uh, so to make things easy for you i have pointed out all the p waves which are seen here so basically what is happening is this is 2 to 1 av block and the second p wave is falling on t wave that's why you see such pointed t waves 
so if you see such pointed t waves if you see carefully in v2 at uh, the t wave is biphasic so the biphasic t waves are always abnormal so either there is a p wave hidden into them or there is ischemia going on so if you carefully map these patients uh, mark these p waves and carefully see uh, this is a 2 is to 1 av block and the conducted pr is long then you have right bundle branch block so you have right bundle branch block and 2 is to 1 av block so with this itself i think if you uh, go for a pacemaker it's reasonable so this is how sometimes a simple 2 is to 1 av block can uh, mimic and fool us so this was the other ecg from the same patient so at this time this was 2 is to 1 av block with left bundle branch block so now you have another indication that is alternating left bundle and right bundle branch block patterns and if we monitor even longer as you can see we monitored him for much longer and now you can see clearly uh, that there is a high grade av block so there are more than two p waves uh, more than one p wave which is blocked so this p wave is blocked there this p wave is blocked this is conducted with an lbbb then the next one is conducted with an right bundle branch block pattern that indicates that or uh, the conduction system is diseased whether or not this patient had syncope or not a pacemaker is still indicated the last question for uh, my talk so uh, this is from a 55 year old male patient history of recurrent syncope and most of the episodes occurred in standing position there are two there is history of two falls and uh, lv function was normal so uh, middle age patient recurrent syncope and syncope occurred in standing position lv function is normal so this patient underwent an holter at some other center and as happens commonly with us uh, i got a uh, just a snapshot of single page of holter on this uh, on whatsapp so this was forwarded to me and uh, so based on the light of these findings uh, the physician asked me whether uh, what should be the further approach for this patient so i thought this is a good ecg because it demonstrate very important point so the questions are uh, how would you manage for this patient okay so the first option is there is a definite indication of pacemaker uh, second option is this patient needs a tilt table test uh, third option is this patient needs a tilt table test plus minus pacemaker so we are not sure about pacemaker but he might need a tilt table test to to, uh, to further confirm or to further evaluate whether this was a vasovagal syncope or not so these are the options very simple options i believe most And, of them uh, 60% feel that uh, it is a definite indication for pacemaker okay and okay. another 30% was... feels heart plus pacemaker right so uh, that was the main concern of the referring physician and many of the times uh, we, we do see such uh, ecgs or such holter tracing where things uh, look difficult for us so so i uh, simplified this for you so that i marked the p waves so what you can see is there is definitely one blocked p wave and the, the next p wave is conducted the next to next p wave is also conducted and what you can you have to understand is that uh, i have zoomed in the time at this happened so this is somewhere around in the morning 5 am so probably the patient was in deep sleep during this time and uh, you can see that the pp interval is quite long if you see 1 2 3 4 5 5 five boxes so the uh, there is sinus bradycardia which is going on and uh, the conducted pr is shorter and the next pr is even longer so this is nothing but mobile type 1 av block and there is uh, there is white vagotonia as can as is evident from sinus bradycardia so this being brings me to the last point of the today's presentation uh, what about vagal av block how does one approach a vagal av block this patient had vagal av block and the correct answer was a tilt table test plus minus pacemaker pacemaker may not be needed in majority of the patient with vasovagal syncope but in certain indication certain patients uh, even if with uh, vagal av block pacemaker is indicated we'd like to see them first uh, we'd like to know how to differentiate vagally mediated av block from bradycardia dependent av block so we need to understand that vagally mediated av block usually will have sinus bradycardia so you have sinus slowing during ventricular asystole and as sinus acceleration occurs there is resumption of a1 is to 1 av conduction and the wide qrs escape is usually infrequent here while in bradycardia dependent av block the qrs is almost always wide that is escape pr prolongation is usually not present and sinus rate is usually unchanged or increased so if you have sinus tachycardia with av block it cannot be a vagal av block it has to be a significant bradycardia mediated uh, 
AV block, or in the other words, it has to be an infra Hessian AV block. While uh, a, a AV block which is associated with sinus bradycardia, one must rule out vaguely mediated AV block. Now this is again uh, ILR trace uh, from uh, Holter trace, sorry, from a patient who had vaguely mediated AV block. In this patient, he was having recurrent symptoms. As you can see, there is sinus tachycardia, one is to one AV conduction. Then there is sinus bradycardia, still one is to one AV conduction. And then there is a prolonged uh, high grade AV block preceded by sinus bradycardia and sinus bradycardia is continuing there. But as sinus uh, rate begins to accelerate, there is resumption of one is to one conduction. So if these patients develop significant symptoms or there is history of malignant syncope, that is patient has recurrent falls, significant injuries, or patient is in a, in a profession that involves, uh, that endangers other people's life, such as driving or uh, maybe uh, flight attendants or pilots, then probably these patients need to be taken much more seriously. And in patients who had documented sinus uh, vagal AV block with associated malignant injuries, pacing is still indicated. So these are the indications of permanent pacing in patients with reflex syncope. So if you have spontaneous asystolic pauses, uh, which are vaguely mediated, or you give adenosine, uh, adenosine and you see there is a prolonged AV block and there are symptoms, then pacing has a class two indication. Otherwise, if you have uh, hyper, uh, carotid sinus hypersensitivity, that is patient is having recurrent syncope, symptoms, falls, injuries, you do a carotid sinus massage, there is a long three second pause, then again pacing may be indicated in this patient which is class 2A. Uh, otherwise, if none of these are present and there is a uh, tilt table tilt tables shows uh, asystolic tilt, again here pacing is not of uh, you know that much importance, it is class 2B. So that is the benefit is uncertain here. In undocumented synco, pacing is not indicated. So with that, I think I'll close uh, my presentation. Uh, this is a quote from Sir William Osler, which I think fits very well in management of syncope. That is you observe, record, tabulate, communicate, use all your five senses, learn to see, learn to hear, learn to feel, and learn to smell, and know that by practice alone, one can become an expert. So thanks. Uh, if there are any questions, I can take them. And this is our ECG group on WhatsApp. If somebody wants to join, you can con contact the IPCA team, local IPCA team, which has been giving you the invitations so that I can add you on to this ECG group. Totally dedicated group to ECGs only. There are no social uh, messages exchanged here in this group. So there are a few questions that I'd like to uh, discuss with you. Sure, one, is, one is like, uh, if you have a patient who has a high PVC load, say something like 20, 25 percent, 15, 20 percent, and has uh, vaguely mediated uh, bradycardia during sleep. How would you like to manage this patient? No senko. Okay. So there are two issues. There is bradycardia, which is probably vaguely mediated during sleep, and there are high burden of PVCs. Uh, so are there no structural, uh, there are no other clues on ECG that this PVC, there is structural heart disease? No. The echo is normal, ECG otherwise does not tell you that it is anything okay. abnormal. So, sir, I patient would like to know first... surgery. So, it's one of my patients who had been uh, having okay. bariatric surgery done around one and a half years. Right, sir. So, sir, I think I'd like to see the morphology of PVCs. So, there are uh, PVCs which we know clearly that these they are arising from certain locations like RVOT. Uh, so, the PVC is in structurally normal heart. Then there are certain locations we know that if PVC is suggesting uh, origin from these locations, probably has structural heart disease. So even though ECG is normal or echo is normal, we cannot rule out structural heart disease. First thing I'd like to do is uh, to do a cardiac MRI for this patient because low, load is 20%, which is uh, which cannot be neglected. Anything more than 10% should be you know uh, treated as significant. So cardiac MRI first to rule out any structural heart disease. Uh, prolonged monitoring to look for whether NSVT is there or not. If cardiac MRI turns out to be normal, uh, then only uh, then we can offer ablation first medical therapy, then ablation. If does, medical therapy doesn't suppress this, if cardiac MRI turns out to be abnormal, then probably you need to do a PET and uh, maybe then the treatment course entirely changes. And if asymptomatic vagal bradycardia seen in night, which is common, we see it day in and out in all the holders daily. So it doesn't need any um, specific uh, Using special, I think. Uh, to treat it, you are not concerned that it may aggravate the bradycardia at, at night. 
no sir if uh, bradycardia occurring at night symptomatic bradycardia is what we should be worried about if the if a patient is receiving beta blockers the so first thing we'll like to see on follow up whether the pvc burden has remained same or it has reduced or if the pvc burden has reduced then what has happened to the sinus node and whether the beta blocker is causing significant sinus node dysfunction or not then we need to take it from there you know because beta blocker if suppresses this pvc then it become an essential drug for this patient and if beta blocker is causing significant bradycardia then probably he'll need a pacing or he'll need an ablation so that he needs to be taken off beta blocker your junior from sms dr jogesh is asking how sensitive and specific are smartphones smartphones for detecting arrhythmia i think there is one study regarding that app which is from the apple watch so it is it has been found to be useful for detection of atrial fibrillation so that is what in terms of uh, you know scientific evidence that exists it exists only for the app which is with there with the apple uh, smartwatch i have not used it personally so i and the rest of the other things are probably i think propaganda driven and there is no evidence for them um, hey. anjay you have any experience on those apps i am not using an apple phone uh, apple watch that was as far as i know and i have not been personally using them but uh, if people have an apple watch they are uh, uh somebody who feels yes. they they have an irregular heart beat i think they have the device where they can record an ecg at least a uh, yes. single lead ecg so an educated person probably could right. use them where you want to know whether he is in fib or he is having uh, or not any right. symptoms during that uh, period apart from that i think there is one study which i had heard of i am not remembering it but there is one study which has been published that this This is good enough to detect atrial fibrillation. Silent mm. episodes of it. There's exactly. a definite study where they have, uh, you know, confirmed that it can be used uh, for a rhythmic detection. Right. That's that's published in one of the American journals. So it's a great right. study. Uh, the last question for Javed is, uh, what is how most of our audience are physicians. So what is the treatment for bradyarrhythmias? arrhythmias? The drug treatment, not for pacemakers and other things. <laughs> or how they will manage it before? shifting that patient to you as so, uh, a symptomatic i think most of the we don't have much drugs in our armamentarium to you know treat the bradycardia or uh, only thing we have is uh, i think uh, orsipranolin that is used for sinus node dysfunction and uh, i think uh, there is one more which is from that uh, etophilin group theophilin group i think uh, theobit trial which has been shown uh, that uh, it has of some uh, because some use in patients who have sinus node dysfunction and cannot avail a pacemaker but in otherwise if you see av blocks or uh, symptomatic av blocks if you have symptoms specifically syncope i think there is no role of medical therapy uh, because these patients are high highest risk of dying paroxysmal av third degree av block with history of syncope and uh, other than that sinus node dysfunction uh the treatment that is uh, implantation of pacemaker to relieve symptoms uh, it doesn't prolong uh, life you know it doesn't prevent mortality uh only thing is if the patient is having sinus arrest or long sinus pauses only then uh or chronotropic incompetence it does improve otherwise it doesn't and uh, most of these patients even how long you feed treat them on elipent or or see best uh, i think it doesn't work uh, more or less later on they develop symptoms despite uh, this therapy and they will require pacemaker implantation probably other than the congenital heart blocks most of yeah. them would be needing a permanent pacemaker permanent pacemaker there you right. have to make a difference if it's a congenital heart block probably that those patients can be left but they don't need the drug treatment also yes even even in that scenario i think there is lot of research which has shown that all congenital complete heart blocks should be paced so it's an area of debate but uh, that is one school of thought that is rapidly yeah. gaining you know evidence so i think we move to dr sanjay's presentation which is also on syncope and now he has a tougher time because javed has you know taken the most of the limelight and explained so questions i hope that there will be more uh, because i had to teach and now he will quiz them so i had to take more time so that they can answer his question easily dr sanjay please yes sir yes sir it's for uh, thank you uh, uh, smith sir uh, javed boss and uh, deepka team for uh, running this show again successfully despite the many hurdles so i think javed boss and i we've always enjoyed uh, discussing ecgs and uh, fine tuning our knowledge i think however old you get or however young you are in your medical uh, 
life you you're always fascinated by ecgs because at the end of the day there's definitely one new point which you will learn be it a single ecg also that's what i i and we always tell all our uh, students and friends that every ecg take take give it a fresh approach don't uh, run through an ecg be systematic evaluate the patient and uh, go ahead with ecg so i think the following will be case scenarios and uh, we probably i'll run through them and there'll be a question probably after each case so and we will have the poll so and uh, so we can uh, go ahead yeah so first of all this is an 87 year old male with advanced parkinsons so he has never had syncope the year before only for the past one year he has had syncope three times over the past one year and the syncopes are unrelated to posture so the parkinsons has been there for 10 years Nine years, he was absolutely okay. For the last one year, three times head injury, unrelated to posture. So this is his baseline ECG. Uh, you can all have a look at the ECG. And the this is my question. So the syncope is most probably due to Parkinson's. So refer him to a neurologist for better care. Uh, would you do a twenty-four hour halter if the halter is normal? Send him home. or would you do a diagnostic ep study so i think from what uh, javed boss has uh, told all of us i think we we should use that information uh, to arrive at the answer so just to highlight again so he has had three episodes over the last one year they are not very frequent episodes so uh, i think we we've started the poll so i'll just run through the ecg so we know that uh, uh, this is sinus rhythm with uh, 1s2 and av conduction but there is definite right bundle branch block and the axis is uh, leftward you are having uh, 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 avl which is positive so probably it's uh, axis of minus 45 so it's probably right, right bundle branch block with a left anterior hemi block and the patient has come to you with syncope so uh, smith sir what about the poll Yeah, poll. They uh, need majority says diagnostic EP study, and few thirty three percent say syncope is because of Parkinsonism. Yeah, so excellent. I think uh, Javed sir has done uh, a great job. So we definitely don't uh, send him to the neurologist because uh, a syncope in a patient with a bundle branch block, be it left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block, particularly when you have a bifascicular block. you you assume that syncope due to a conduction system disease and holter wouldn't we wouldn't do in this patient because it probably be normal anyways because his symptoms are so infrequent and we would send him home so how does a diagnostic ep study help us so this is a usual trace which we see in our diagnostic ep study so we put a catheter in the atrium we put a catheter in the region of the his so his catheter basically measures intervals across the av node and the bundle of his so this is the his signal and this is called the hv interval the uh, time taken from the his signal to travel up to the ventricular signal so in this patient his uh, uh, hv interval was 70 so we have a cut off of uh, 55 millisecond so uh, anything uh, more than um, uh, 100 without symptom is significant and more than uh, 60 with symptom is significant so this hv interval is significant for this patient So this patient we had taken in for physiological pacing. This short note on physiological pacing. So as we know traditionally we put the RV pacing lead into the RV apex, and that has many disadvantages. It can have a pacing induced LV dysfunction. So physiological pacing has come up in the fact that we can capture the conduction system and give the patient a normal physiological QRS. You can either uh, capture the bundle of his, or you can capture the left bundle, the anterior, the posterior fascicle. so we took him up for a conduction system pacing this is a short video you can see the lead with the sheet you can see how the lead is penetrating the septum and this is a sheet and you which shows that the lead has penetrated deep into the septum and this is the final lead position which you will see so this is the atrial lead i'm sorry yeah so you have the atrial lead and the uh, his lead left bundle lead there so the advantage in this patient we did a left bundle branch pacing you can see the above the first ecg the bipolar pace ecg which which in fact looks like a normal uh, qrs and the below was his pre existing uh, right bundle branch block so giving somebody this kind of a qrs 
is uh, professionally very satisfying and you know that he'll definitely not run into pacing induced uh, LV dysfunction due to dyssynchrony. So this is the uh, echo. You can see the pacing lead across the septum. And again, you can see the pacing lead across the septum. And you can see the pacing lead clearly running across the septum. So uh, take home points, uh, syncope. Uh, so when do you investigate with a diagnostic EP study? I would say uh, not all syncope. You, you should definitely have a, a, a severity to the syncope. Syncope with any kind of injury to the head and multiple syncope. Uh, and definitely when you know it's not uh, related to a posture, it's not vasovagal. And even if the ECG, if the echo, the holder, if the troponin, everything might be normal, we look for additional things. Uh, you look whether the patient has a baseline bundle branch block, either left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block with left axis, meaning it's a bi bifascicular block. You have alternating bundle branch block, which Dr. Javed was had shown, and you have baseline prolonged PR interval. And you have something called masquerading bundle branch block also. So we'll just talk about what masquerading bundle branch block is. So it's, uh, you have two types of masquerading bundle branch block. It is uh, the standard type is where you have right bundle branch block in the precordial leads and left bundle branch block in the limb leads. So usually with a right bundle branch block in the limb leads, you have a deep S wave in lead one and AVL and you have uh, 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 upright uh, uh, R waves in two, three AVF. So if you have loss of S wave in lead one AVL and QS in two, three AVF, you call it the standard masquerading bundle branch block. The precordial type, you have RBB pattern in the precordial lead from V1 to V3. And from V4 to V6, you don't have the RS pattern. You just have a dominant R wave. So the, this is the standard type of masquerading bundle branch block, which is very common uh, among patients who have syncope and who present with the right bundle branch block. So you should always look for this. So this is the second case, uh, an interesting case. So this was a 53 year old female, hypertension diabetes uh, on long-term uh, thiazide diuretic. She had recurrent episodes of syncope for the last two days, almost 15 to 20 episodes, uh, all uh, hemodynamically unstable. She injured herself once and no family history of SCD. So we were fortunately able to capture one such episode. So uh, I'll show you uh, three ECGs and then I'll go on to the question. So this is a case uh, case study as such. So this is, you, you can see it's a polymorphic VT and you can also see after the polymorphic VT which self terminates, the definite, uh, there is QT uh, prolongation and very broad uh, T waves. And thereafter, uh, when a patient came back in sinus rhythm, you can see th this is something which I always like to measure the from the peak of the T wave to the end of the T wave, uh, there are studies which show even in uh, congenital long QT syndrome or even in patients who have acquired long QT. If the peak of T wave to the end of the T wave is more than 100 milliseconds, the patient is at high risk of uh, tossards. So this patient, peak, uh, her initial admission potassium was very low and uh, there, there was low magnesium. We corrected her almost for 15 to 20 days. And for a period, she, she would have episodes even with the normal potassium. So then we decided to put in a temporary pacemaker, but still, even with the pacing, you can see pacing at the rate of 100, the QTC has not normalized. It was uh, 5, 10 milliseconds, even with the normal potassium and normal magnesium. So then uh, uh, thiazides, we had stopped. We corrected the electrolyte. Uh, we thought whether that could be an underlying channelopathy, so we, uh, a long QT. So we, in fact, started propranolol. Episodes continued. We put a pacing wire in the ventricle. Episodes continued. We, in fact, did a bilateral cardiac sympathetic denervation for this patient. The episodes continue. And finally, we did a atrial base pacing. And then the episodes started coming down. So this was the atrial pacing. We uh, kept the atrial rate to that point where the QT interval shortened. So we kept, we kept pacing the atrium at a rate of 100. And then 100, I think it was 110. And we saw that the QT interval at that rate was relatively narrower. So this is the post pacemaker ECG. You can see that the QT, you can see the pacing spike before the T waves, and this is almost at the rate of 110. And the QT interval had come down, and she was uh, uh, symptom free. So, my question is in this patient, she's a 50, 58 year old, uh, uh, is a genetic analysis warranted? Would you screen her for long QT genes? Yes or no?
Yeah, I think, that, sir, uh, we have any uh, poll yeah. results? Just waiting for 20 seconds so that. Okay, okay sir. So, I, just to recap, this was a patient, elderly patient, who came with resistant uh, uh, long QT on the ECG with multiple symptomatic episodes. Uh, prior to this, she was not symptomatic. Despite correction of electrolytes, she's had persistent symptoms. Only after an AI pacing and probably the combination of beta blocker and sympathetic denervation, probably all three in combination helped her. Yeah. So we have the results. Uh, yes is 66% and no is 33%. Yeah. Uh, so this actually was uh, was an interesting case for all of us. And uh, this case was, uh, was uh, it was there when we did our fellowship at uh, Mayadma Meta Jayadeva. So in this patient, we in fact went for a genetic study. The reason why we went is a couple of uh, pointers because the uh, the T wave morphology at, uh, uh, at some of those episodes, we, we were able to see that there were some bifid T waves. There was a long T peak to T end, which is more common with some, some specific channelopathies, particularly the long QT2. And the response the patient had to the atrial base pacing, we thought that most of her. Uh, 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 events were because of a pause related syncope. So we, we actually postulated that she could have, and we were fortunate to have got the uh, positive genetic result. So, and uh, post pacemaker, the patient did not have any further episodes. She was discharged and she was asymptomatic. In fact, this patient actually deserves an ICD, a dual chamber ICD, but because of financial constraints, we had to put her on a, a atrial base pacing. So just a quick recap. So we have uh, the three most common, long QT, one, two, and three. Uh, as we know, the uh, I like to uh, direct your attention to the uh, potassium channel. The IKS is involved in long QT1, I, IKR, and long QT2. And these are two long uh, loss of function mutation. And uh, the I9 in uh, SC and 5A is a gain of function mutation. And long QT1 is usually seen in... Uh, in, with exercises, particularly because IKS is responsible for shortening of the QT interval when the rate increases. Because of the loss of function mutation, as you exercise, the QT doesn't shorten and the patient has symptoms only with exercise. Uh, whereas in long QT2, the, you have, it's a pause dependent uh, TOSAT where you have uh, prolongation of the QT interval at slower rate. So uh, if you see, uh, this is also helps you in managing these patients. So you know that uh, basically you, there's no point in putting a pacemaker in a patient who has long QT1 because anyway, he's going to have lo uh, even longer QT at faster rate. But uh, pacing is definitely indicated in post-dependent long QT2. And in specific LQT3, you can try uh, QT definitely shortens with mixiltine. So that is the idea of a genetic analysis. One, you can actually... It is a pharmaco uh, genomics where you know the uh, genomics and you can titrate the therapy. And number two, you can screen your family members also. And one more important thing, long QT1, the highest risk, and it's most commonly seen in patients in young males less than 40 years, uh, whereas long QT2 is seen in the reproductive age group women. They are at the maximum highest risk. And LQT3 is seen in elderly patients where the highest risk is there. So uh, the, uh, another short an important note on the T wave morphology, uh, there was just probably brushed through it. Long QT1 has a very broad based T wave. So as, I, as you know, in the action potential, the IKS is responsible for the early part of the repolarization and IKR is responsible for the latter part of the repolarization. That's why in long QT1, where the IKS is involved, you have increase in the duration from the onset of the T wave to the peak of the T wave. So you have a very broad T wave. Whereas in long QT2, you have uh, IKR is responsible for the latter half of the T wave. So you have a bifid T wave. And in fact, when you measure from the peak of the first by, uh, uh, T to the end of the T wave, more than 100 milliseconds, it's in fact a risk marker for sudden cardiac death. And in long QT3, you have a long isoelectric line followed by the T wave. So take home message, I would say electrolyte abnormalities in old age, probably now patient she, the episodes of hypokalemia just pushed her to the tossard. So uh, channelopathies being unmasked by such electrolyte disturbances can occur. And genetic analysis is useful, one, to treat these patients uh, uh, with a particular type of pharmacotherapy and to also restructify the family members. 
So this is the third case. So this is another patient, uh, post mitral valve uh, replacement with a tricuspid anuloplasty. She had mild LV dysfunction with an LA size of 5.7. She was complaining of disabling palpitations and breathlessness. And she was started on uh, Cardivas, 3.125 half blood, uh, uh, twice daily. The reason why such a small dose was given because as you can see, there's a halter of the patient. Uh, all of you can look, you, can, you have episodes of uh, probably um, ill sustained fibrillation of flutter and you have a sinus pause. So uh, probably the treating physician felt that uh, no need to give on a higher dose where the sinus pause would have, uh, get aggravated. But she was definitely had disabling palpitations. She, she wouldn't tolerate her uh, palpitation. And so uh, after two days, uh, she complains of severe fatigue and you can see this ECG. So uh, I'd like all of you to have a look at the ECG and I want uh, you to tell me, how do you treat this patient? So could you stop the beta blocker? And if the rhythm reports to normal, no pacemaker, just send her home. Uh, number two, beta blocker with a dual chamber pacemaker. Number three, beta blocker with a CRPP. So I think we can start the poll now. And uh, just to give a background, the patient has mild LV dysfunction EF of 40%. And she's very symptomatic for, for her palpitations. She's not able to tolerate her palpitations. So it's a classic tachybrady syndrome. What would you do? So just uh, going on with the ECG, you can see uh, uh, that there are no P waves and uh, the baseline is absolutely flat with uh, uh, a regular RR interval and uh, there are no peak P waves. So from the last uh, 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 talk, uh, three possibilities, either it's an atrial fibrillation with a complete heart block or it's a slow junctional rhythm or it's severe hypo hyperkalemia with uh, sinoventricular rhythm. The T waves are not peak, it's not uh, severe hypokalemia. So either it's a junctional rhythm or an AF with a complete AV block. So based on her background with those runs of flutters, so probably it's a AF with complete heart, uh, AV block. So let's see how do we treat and let's see what you've decided. Uh, Smith, sir. Dr. Sanjay, the house is divided between beta uh, blocker with dual chamber and beta blocker with triple chamber pacemaker. So okay. okay. And so, uh, yeah. oh, okay, sir. So this is a common uh, clinical uh, uh, conundrum which all of us face. So number one, I'm happy that all of you decided that we have to treat the patient with beta blocker. That's absolutely right. Number two, do we provide her with a dual chamber pacer or a CRT? The problem is in a patient who requires more than 60% of pacing and who has even a borderline LV dysfunction, studies have shown that the pacing itself, because you're pacing the right ventricular muscle, the myocardium, that this synchronous contract the LBB which you're going to induce in that patient can aggravate the LB dysfunction. So guidelines say that you are justified in putting a CRPP. So uh, in this patient, uh, we had discussed with the patient's family, uh, uh, she had atrial fibrillation and that was a permanent AFib. So we're not going to treat the AFib with uh, uh, rhythm therapy. We are going to leave the patient in AFib. Uh, we in fact uh, went for a left bundle pacing. So I'll show you why. So we put a backup. Uh, so this is the uh, his uh, catheter which we use as a marker. And uh, this fluoroscopic view is is a beautiful fluoroscopic view. You can actually see the tricuspid valve ring. And this is the mitral valve ring. And this is the RV pacing lead which we used as a backup because the surgeon was actually insistent that he wants a backup uh, RV lead. In fact, you actually don't need this backup lead also just this left bundle lead would be sufficient. You can see it's going across the septum. In this LAO view, you have both the annuli in parallel facing you and the septum is exactly perpendicular. And you can see that the lead has gone across the septum. And in the lateral view, dead lateral view, you can see this is the anterior uh, sternum and the septum is posterior and it's posteriorly directed. So this is the, we had a very good, uh, uh, result in this patient and I'll show you. So we paste the patient in DVI mode. So the left bundle is capturing with the RV sensing. So we put in a dual chamber pacemaker. We didn't use the atrial lead at all because she was in AFL. And you can see you're getting a very narrow QRS. And this is the QRS in RV septal pacing. Though we achieved a good septal location, uh, comparing this QRS with this, definitely you know that the patient is going to have better hemodynamic uh, parameters with this kind of a pacing where you're capturing the conduction system. 
So tachybaradi syndrome, first of all, drugs for the tachy and pacing for the baddy. Uh, previous RV pacing alone can worsen the underlying LV dysfunction with these patients have. Physiological pacing is a viable option because number one, the cost is not more. Uh, in fact, we could have just used a single chamber pacemaker for this previous patient, just put in, screwed in the left bundle lead to that single chamber port and the patient would have done absolutely fine. Basically, the R RV lead uh, was only uh, put because of the insistence of the surgeon and the patient is absolutely fine. So this is another interesting case, a 58-year-old female with one episode of graying of vision. So she came to us with uh, this ECG and graying of vision. So I'll just give you 10 seconds to uh, go through this ECG. Sinus with the monus 2 and AV conduction, probably an incomplete right bundle branch block, T inversion V1 to V3, QTC is normal. And uh, so another ECG was recorded uh, from her previous record. And there was absolutely no symptoms during this ECG. So I want you to look at this ECG and tell me, uh, number one, A, is this Mobitz type one AV block, Mobitz type two AV block, or you need more data? Based on this ECG, I want you to give me an answer. Dr. Sanjay, there are no takers. <laughs> okay. So this is basically a two is to one AV block. And it's very difficult to tell whether uh, it's a Mobitz type one or a Mobitz type two. Mobitz type one is the Venki back AV block and Mobitz type two is the uh, more severe type of AV block. With the two is to one AV block, it's, it's, it's very difficult. You, you actually cannot say. It could be either of the one. So you need more data. So we did a TMT for this patient. So you can see this was her exercising on the TMT and you can see the rhythm strip. So you have uh, uh, the heart rate is uh, 112 and uh, after uh, the sinus rate of 110 and you have a drop P wave. And again, I'll show you this, it's more clear. So you can see this rhythm again. And after observing this, I want you to now tell me whether that's Mobitz type one or type two. Or again, whether you need more data. Dr. Sanjay, it's 100% for Mobitz type two. Yeah, so I think they got the uh, uh, information that yeah, there's definitely no progressive increase in the PR interval. The PR interval is fixed and you have a drop P wave and this definitely Mobitz type 2. So we did a halter because this patient's symptom was just a graying of vision. There was no uh, uh, syncope. So I, I wanted more information from this patient. So And her symptoms were fairly uh, frequent. So this wasn't a 24-hour halter. So as Javid sir rightly pointed out, we always look at the time during the holder. So this was at 9 p.m. when she was awake and probably just had her dinner and she was uh, just walking. So I want you to tell me what, what have I encircled? Is that a block atrial ectopic? Is that high grade AV block? Or is that a sinus pause? Again, no takers. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I'm not sure if my questions are too difficult, uh, but I, I, I would encourage all of you at least to give uh, a try so that uh, it, it would direct you in a particular line of thinking, be it wrong or right, and you would know how to go back or deviate away from that line, line of thinking. So this is in fact, if you measure these two PP interval, this is sinus, and we know that she had a 2 is 2 AV block. So this sinus, PP interval and this PP interval is definitely shorter. So this is an atrial ectopic which has blocked and this interval is definitely longer. So this is the post uh, uh, extrasystolic pause. So this is in fact a, a, a blocked atrial extrasystolic 
it also shows that the conduction system is diseased at the heart rate of say 150 she is not able to conduct so we in fact did an ep study for her and uh, this is the baseline uh, e uh, intervals uh, as i told you the atrial we we i would like direct your attention to the uh, markers which are shown as his distal and his proximal so you can see the a the h and the b so when we started pacing her at a rate of 110 you can see the first speed you are having the a h v i in fact uh, darkened out the h uh, so that you can actually make it out and then the a h blocks and then again you can see the a h v and then there is a h but no v so this is in fact a 2 is to 1 infrahesian av block so this is what we see with most of the uh, mobits type 2 av block most of the mobits type 2 say around 75 of them percent of them are an infrahesian av block and probably 25 are intrahesian the disease is within the uh, bundle of his but in both the cases the disease is below the av node whereas in mobits type 1 most of the disease is above the bundle of his either within the av node which javed sir uh, told that your vaguely uh, mediated uh, 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 winky wacking which occurs during sleep is probably is just a vagal phenomenon which is acting on the av node so we did a uh, uh, left bundle pacing for her and this was the ecg so you can in fact see that with the left bundle pacing the incomplete rbb had corrected in her so uh, two is to one av block i think david boss also told uh, to you uh, how to go about that so uh, this is the esc guideline which say that pacing is indicated in uh, patients with third degree or second degree type 2 av block irrespective of symptoms so if you have a mobit type 2 you can definitely go for a pacing even if the patient is not symptomatic because as i told you most of the block due to a mobit type 2 is below or within the bundle of his and in a patient with a second degree type 1 av block which causes symptoms or is found to be located at the intra or the infra isian level at the e during eps you can you are probably two way indication so in a patient with a 2 is to 1 av block where you are not able to determine whether it's a uh, 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 mobit type 1 or type 2 you uh, you look for the history history of syncope definitely give priority to that history make sure it's not vasovagal if the patient has a baseline bundle branch block be it right bundle or left bundle that again indicates that there is some disease below the av node in the infrahesian conduction system disease and you can do a holter or a tmt to look for the mobit type 2 av block like in our patient and you can do an ep study also to demonstrate that the block is at the infrahesian level so all these information give us justice that we we are doing something for the patient and she will be relieved of her symptoms so this is the fifth case a very interesting case so the 55 year old female with history of a pacemaker permanent pacemaker a uh, single chamber pacemaker which was put 6 months back for intermittent complete av block so this was the record which i got from the previous physician and the coronary angiogram was done at that point it was normal and the there was a normal lv function apparently at that point and now she was admitted with pre syncope and breathlessness so this was the ecg uh, so this is an ecg based question so i want you to tell me whether this is a pace ecg or is a patient having bt so it was a single chamber pacemaker 6 month back for intermittent complete av block so house is undivided for pace ecg okay i think uh, oh undivided for pace ecg so, so you you mentioned all of them have chosen pace ecg yes okay okay so uh, this is in fact what the uh, er physician also thought but there are some clues why this definitely cannot be a pace ecg so uh, uh, when you see the in lead uh, one you have the first second third beat and the fourth beat so before the fourth beat you have a p wave so that is something what we call a, a capture or a fusion beat and again in lead avf uh, uh, a fifth six seven eighth beat so you have a p wave so that that is a capture beat so you have these two capture beat and uh, a fusion beat and uh, 
the, to call it a PACE CCG, it definitely looks the morphology V1, V2, V3, it's an LBB morphology. But uh, a very important point, uh, if this was a, a, a permanent pacing lead, so you can get an inferior axis, which is uh, directed 2, 3 AVF, which is positive, if the lead is placed in the RV outflow. So most of uh, our pacing is either done in the mid septum or apical septum, where 2, 3 AVF is negative. But you can, in fact, get a 2, 3 AVF positive if you place the lead in the RV outflow. But you can almost never get an ECG, a paced ECG, which is having a QS pattern in lead 1 or ABL. That can never occur. It means that the beat is coming from the, from the lateral wall of the LV. So this itself, the lead 1 Q wave, the lead 1 a, uh, ABL having Q wave can only occur if the patient has a CRP. This was a single chamber RV pacing. This can never be a PSG CCG. So this in fact was a slow VP this patient had. And this was the PSG CCG. So this uh, is to show you that the 2, 3 AVF uh, are inferiorly uh, uh, are negative, meaning that it was an apically placed lead activation is going away from 2, 3 AVF. And you can see lead 1 and AVL. They are not negative. It is uh, positive. But V1 to V6, you can have any kind of morphology. So always uh, direct your attention to the precordial leads, but also to the chest leads when you when you want to decipher an ECG if it's based or not. So uh, coming to this patient again, this was a very interesting case. So we were all worried. Uh, why why is she having this slow uh, VT? Which which the VT was in fact very incessant. So we put her on uh, cordrone. She did not uh, respond. We had to uh, give uh, xylocard and then put on her on mixolytin. So this was the ECG after a couple of days when we reduced the pacing rate to. Uh, 30 because I wanted to see her intrinsic conduction. So uh, what do you see from this ECG? Just to help you out, uh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. So there are two beats. The uh, One beat is always followed by the P wave. That is the intrinsic beat. And then you're having an ectopic beat. So I, I want you to look at the intrinsic beat carefully and tell me that if the intrinsic beat does in fact suggest that she has a structurally normal heart, or a structurally abnormal heart. Because uh, as I told you, the previous uh, physician told me that the echo was normal. So I, I want to ask you whether you would, from the ECG, you would say whether this uh, it's a normal heart or whether you want an echo. I think that we can start the poll. And the ECG also shows some QT prolongation, probably because of the amyotron which was given to her. But I want to direct your attention to the native QRS. So everyone wants to get an echo done. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, the most important part of the ECG. So this is how we, we look at the ECG for clinical clues. So the V1 to V3, you can see there are deep Q waves there. That's, that's, that's not normal. V1, you should have an R wave in V1, which is a septally act activation, which is coming from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart, because the V1 will show the initial R. That is, you're having deep Q wave from V1 to V3. So it means that she has a dense scar in the septum. So why would somebody, a 55-year-old uh, female who is apparently normal, six months in the course, angiogram normal, why would she have a dense septal scar? So let us see. So this was her echo. So I want all of you to see the echo. So those who aren't familiar with the echo, this is a four-chamber view. This is the RA, this is the LA. This is the LV and this is the RV. So this is a septum. So as we predicted, there is a dense septal scar. The lateral wall is contracting. Okay, but the septum is definitely dense and it's scarred. And again, this is another short axis view. This is the LV and this is the RV. You can just see the pacing lead uh, going in and around here. And again, there is a septal scar. And this is a parasternal long axis view. This is the LA. This is the LV. You can see again, there is dense scarring. Uh, the because the uh, gain settings are a little high, but uh, the, uh, the septum is not contracting at all. So now, uh, I'm sorry, the question. So the echo shows the dense septal scar. The CAG is normal. Uh, and I saw the CAG, the coronary angiogram is absolutely normal. And she has a ventricular pacing percentage of 33%. So I, now we are interested in finding out why this patient who had an apparently normal echo uh, developed an LV dysfunction uh, in six months. So is the diagnosis pacing-induced cardiomyopathy? Did the pacing alone cause uh, this entire spectrum of clinical findings? 
or uh, you think you need more data you would do a cardiac mri or a cardiac pet or spect i think once again i uh, my question is patient with a normal echo 6 months back develops this echo with a septal scar severe lv dysfunction her angiogram is normal but she was put on a single chamber pacemaker so we all know that patients on single chamber pacemaker can develop pacing induced cardiomyopathy so is this that number 1 or you think you need more data you want a cardiac mri cardiac pet or spect so everyone wants cardiac mri cardiac pet or spect yeah absolutely so i think it's the right answer so the reason being uh, this septal scar is definitely not normal you can have pacing, pacing induced cardiomyopathy where you will have global hypokinesia of the lv uh, but scarring is 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 almost uncommon so uh, so we in fact uh, when uh, because the mri we tried doing it because of uh, her device there was so much of artifact caused by the mri so we did a pet and a spec because we were suspecting an infiltrative cardiomyopathy so a spec is done just to see the viability of the tissue so it said that there was severely reduced near act Uh, near absent uh, system may be uptake in the entire septum whereas the rest of the lv showed normal uptake and the lower down image uh, you can actually see uh, the the area which is uh, lit up by the fdg is the uh, septum which which uh, which is lit up due to the fdg uptake so she has an active inflammatory pathology with scarring in the septum and as i told you her uh, uh, arrhythmia also kept on coming and going to so the same morphology so it indicates an automatic focus which again uh, uh, goes to the clinical diagnosis that she has an inflammatory an automatic uh, pathology which which is causing her symptoms so this in fact was a uh, cardiac sarcoidosis so the patient did well with immunosuppressant so what are the clues for cardiac sarcoidosis so do you do uh, an mri or a pet in all your patients or are there specific clues so number 1 in uh, a patient with an av block for a young age so young uh, uh, guidelines tell us that young is 60 so in any patient with an av block uh, below the age of 60 you 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 are justified in doing a cardiac mr to look for scarring to look for uh, mediastinal nodes uh, and a young patient with unexplained dcm you are justified young patient with a monomorphic vt usually an automatic drug resistant vt but young patient with javisa told us Uh, you have the most common a form of uh, vts in young patients are idiopathic outflow tract ventricular tachycardia which are very very amenable to uh, ablation so that's a completely different subset you identify them by their morphology uh, so apart from that and when you have pleomorphic pvcs pvc is a different uh, morphology and in any young patient who has any permutation or combination of the above three presentation meaning you have an av block with dcm you have dcm with monomorphic vt or you have av block and vt so this you again suspect for cardiac sarcoid in many cases you're not able to do a cardiac mr because that's the most uh, accessible investigation in your center because of the most of the patient have a pacing or a pacemaker leak so at least what as a practice what we used to do is we used to do a screening uh, echo where we we used to look for basal septal thinning it's a very specific marker for uh, a cardiac sarcoid and uh, we can also try in very clinical condition whether the av block is steroid responsive but uh, it's just a hit and try so uh, in our center uh, if an mri is not available we at least do a screening ct of the chest to look for mediastinal nodes because if there are nodes available you know that you're dealing with a systemic sarcoidosis where cardiac sarcoidosis is also involved and if an mri is not available but still we have a high suspicion like in a previous patient we definitely go for a pet because in some some cases uh, if the scarring is not very significant if it's more of an inflammation steroids can actually save these patient we've had uh, patients when we were in jaydeva there was also tell you we we've had many patients who whose echo lv function returned to normal who had very different uh, difficult uh, drug refractory vts uh, which was uh, treated with uh, just uh, steroids immunosuppressant and probably uh, sympathetic denervation because ablation in these patient again you are creating a focus of inflammation and scarring so that can uh, again trigger uh, arrhythmias in such patients so uh, you should have very high index of suspicion so evaluation for sarcoid uh, look for a scar uh, lge particularly a septal scarring a uh, full body pet for metabolic activity a cardiac uh, spect for perfusion defect transbronchial lymph node biopsy because you need histological confirmation also 
So if uh, any area which show activity, particularly the lymph node, the medial channel, or the supraclavicular, you can uh, get a biopsy and your diagnosis is uh, confirmatory and then treat them with immunosuppressant. So our previous patient, she's doing well with immunosuppressant. I couldn't, uh, she actually requires a dual chamber uh, pacing, at least or a left bundle pacing with a uh, uh, defibrillator device, but because of a uh, lack of finances, we couldn't uh, go, go ahead with that. Patient, different kind of patient, a 63 year old, anterior MI, history of an anterior MI with complaints of recurrent palpitation. She ha he has a CRTD, which was put for a complete AV block. So anterior MI, palpitation, his AV conduction, anterior grade A to V is knocked off. It's complete AV block. So he comes with this uh, 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 rhythm and he doesn't receive any shock. It's a CRTD. So, uh, so this is the ECG which he comes with. And just for information, this is the baseline ECG. Uh, as I told you, if, when you have a biventricular pacer, when you have a CRT, you can have Q waves in one NBL. They indicate that you're activating the lateral wall of the LV. Your activation is starting from there. So this is normal for a CRT. The QRS duration is fairly okay. It's around 100 milliseconds. The patient is uh, definitely not a responder because his LV function is low. So the question is this again. So the left one is the PACE ECG. And the right one is the uh, tachycardia ECG. I want you to tell me, uh, is this a pacemaker mediated tachycardia number one? Number two, is this a VT? Or is this an SVT with aberrancy? So the house is divided between VT and the SVT with aberrancy. Okay. Or okay. B and C. So uh, number one, if I had made the question as uh... okay, okay, sir. So one thing uh, I told you, this patient had an AV block, so his A to V conduction cannot occur through the normal axis. So SVT with aberrancy is something which can ne never occur in a patient who has a documented complete AV block. It could e either be a pacemaker mediated tachycardia or OVT. In this patient, you can actually see these two waves. These are the AV dissociation. So though the pace ECG and the uh, VT looks very similar, this was in fact a VT. And uh, this was his second. So going on to the next part of the case and the clinical scenario, so this again shows there's a four chamber view. This is the LA and the LV. It shows a dense anteroseptal and an anterolateral scar. So the pranosternal long axis, you can see a scarring across the entire septum, even across the anteropical uh, lateral part of the LV. <clears throat> so this patient also had slow incessant VT. He actually did not receive any shock because most of his VT rates were slower than the programmed limit for which shock was programmed. For example, you set the shock uh, in a patient with CRTD as 170, most of his VTs were in the range of 150 or 140. So they were only detected and the patient was symptomatic for them. He didn't uh, fall, have a syncope, but he, he felt uneasy, but they weren't shocked. So uh, we gave him cordron, we gave him xylocard, we put him on mixolytine, we gave him stellate ganglion block and the VT was incessant. And just uh, another fact, all the VT had the same morphology. We just slowed down the VT, but the morphology was exactly the same. So uh, uh, we had an angiographic CD. So the lady had a 60, 70 percent disease in, uh, done in 2018. So and he was kept on medical management. So my my question to you is: Next step, uh, do you think that uh, this patient has suddenly developed was such a VT storm? So uh, we should definitely rule out ischemia. I would uh, my first step would be to uh, do a coronary angiogram and uh, stent the LAD if it is the lesion has progressed number one. Or forget about the angioplasty. This patient requires car VT ablation. He requires only an ablation, no angiogram. So I like the poll. So again, the house is divided 50-50 between the two. Yeah. So just, uh, just to take a recap, uh, the... Echo of PC itself, it's a very scarred lady. Uh, this septum in the entire lateral wall is not contracting a lot. So you can see the, uh, the color, it's almost white. 
whereas the, uh, the posterior wall, you see it's contracting well. And so it's a scarred LAD. So we felt that uh, even if there's an 80% disease in the LAD or if the LAD is completely occluded also, you're not going to benefit him in opening up a vessel which is already, uh, which is supplying an impacted territory. So you could argue that to, there could be some hibernating uh, myocardium, we should do a spec spec. But his, all his VT morphology was absolutely the same. It was the same slow VT. It had the tendency of not changing at all. There was, uh, it was never more than a single morphology. So it was scar VT, we were 100% sure. And we took this patient for a scar VT ablation. So the above image is done under 3D. So this dense area. So this is the circuit of the scar. And uh, uh, these are the catheters. So this catheter is within the LV, mapping the scar, this is the ablation catheter. And you can see how the VT circuit is going. So this is the critical isthmus of the uh, circuit and it is activating the lateral part of the LV and the septal aspect in this way. So we gave our lesion in this uh, uh, region and uh, the patient was uh, VT free um, after three hours. So scar VT ablation number one, it's a class one indication for VT storm or patient with recurrent ICD shock due to monomorphic VT. Ischemia can cause polymorphic VT very, very rarely uh, you, you see ischemia causing a monomorphic VT. Infarct always causes monomorphic VT. So uh, uh, coming on uh, to the next case, so it's probably the last case. So, and it's an interesting case. Uh, so it's a 65 year old female with uh, acute onset chest pain uh, for two hours. So this was the ECG which was taken. So I'll run through the ECG, sorry for the bad quality of the ECG. So this is sinus rhythm minus two and AV conduction. You can definitely see ST elevation in lead one AVL with T inversion, uh, prominent ST depressions in uh, V2 to V4. She definitely has uh, uh, some form of an MI, maybe N STEMI or STEMI. So uh, we took her up for an angiogram, and this was the uh, right coronary artery. So the right coronary artery is reasonably okay, no uh, uh, in, uh, occluding uh, vessel. And this was a, she had a critical lesion. This is the left anterior descending. You can see the lady has a critical lesion at this point. And she was successfully stented with uh, uh, this stent. So my question, next what happened to this patient? Post-procedure, this was the ECG. Uh, she was relieved of a heart failure. She in fact was intubate, intubated during the procedure. We extubated her, she was fine having her foot. And she had multiple episodes of syncope, say six hours after the procedure, uh, within uh, one hour, then 10 p.m., 12 a.m., 3 a.m. She had multiple episodes. And uh, uh, because it was in the night, we couldn't actually record the episodes in the monitor, but uh, it was definite uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest. So we connected to the halter and uh, uh, this was a short halter. So it's a very interesting halter. So I want you to tell me what is happening. So, so is this, uh, so this is at 4 p.m. So she's not sleeping, she's awake. And during this episode, she had again uh, a posturing with syncope. So is this a significant sinus pause, number one? Uh, is this complete AV block? Is this a paroxysmal high-grade AV block? Definitely a very interesting case. Uh, yes, sir. In fact, this pause was almost 26 seconds in the holder. It was, uh, we were, we so just saw the holder report, we ran back to her. Paroxysmal high grade AV block. Okay, okay. I think uh, so. Most of them are absolutely right. And interesting thing about the holder is just preceding the block. If you see at this beat, this is an atrial ectopic. She was conducting at a rate of say uh, 110 or uh, 100 and a premature atrial ectopic completely blocked the AV node. She, the AV node is damaged for, it's not conducting for almost 30 seconds and then again it recovers where it's conducting at the rate of 120, 130. So this is a classical paroxysmal high-grade AV block. As David Boss told, this is the most dangerous of AV block. The patient will collapse within, within hours if you don't attend to them. Whereas in a patient who has an AV block with a stable escape rhythm, it's okay. You need not put in a temporary pacemaker. But this patient, we put in a temporary pacemaker <coughs> and we took her up for permanent pacing. The interesting thing is, uh, so this is another holter which shows that multiple episodes. She had 
some episodes uh, preceded by the pac some by pvc so uh, i run through the anjo probably uh, most of us would not have paid much attention so this was the uh, uh, lady which was uh, had a major septal perforator at that point so once again and i'll say both the so you can see this septal perforator and post denting that uh, septal perforator has no flow you can see so definitely because we were going through her angiogram and we were wondering what uh, whether we missed an rca lesion or what went wrong in fact we did a check angio and the status was the same uh, the septal perforator had no flow so now my question is uh, the av block okay is not related to the occluded septal perforator it's just an incidental find, finding number b it's most probably related to the occluded septa, occluded vessel as it supplies a conduction system so i'd like a poll on this so this is the last uh, question so i think all of you can uh, relax and answer this poll is going on there is a seconds. question from dr anuradha from chennai when you call a vpc as benign Sir, uh, there's a question from Doctor Anuradha Chennai. When you okay. call a BPC as benign, ah, when do you call a BPC as benign? Yeah, so there are uh, you have uh, I think uh, uh, some PVCs, particular uh, PVCs of the outflow tract morphology, sir, where you have uh, left frontal branch block morphology with an inferior axis two three AVF positive. AVR, AVR, and AVL negative. So that's a classic outflow tract morphology, uh, either an RVOT or an LBOT, uh, and the patient has uh, uh, a significant. You then do a holter. So the patient comes to you with uh, palpitation. You see the ECG. You have uh, four or five PVCs on the ECG. You do a holter and you record the holter burden. Say you get a burden of uh, say just five percent or. if it is 5000 beats then you don't do anything just reassure the patient just tell them it's an incidental finding so they are benign pvc number two when you have the same pvc even if it's an outflow tract morphology and you have a high burden say more than 20% or more than 20000 then you you at least need to give him some drugs and outflow tract uh, pvcs are uh, sensitive to calcium channel blocker or are very uh, sensitive to radio frequency ablation also you have success rates of around 90% and they they can be targeted easily uh on the other hand this, so this is in a patient with a structurally normal heart so they are probably the benign pvcs in a patient with a structurally abnormal heart say with uh, you suspect infiltrative cardiomyopathy you suspect uh, 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 post myocardial infarction and uh, with with symptoms uh, palpitation syncope even a single pvc in a patient with a syncope could uh, in a patient with an underlying structural heart disease could could be fatal so and javed boss also told about some specific markers of pvcs where pvcs have uh, <coughs> short coupling interval or on t or pvcs causing cardiomyopathy so i think you see the patient as a whole do a holter uh, do the echo get investigated find out what substrate you are dealing with and then you treat them coming back to the poll the house is undivided for not related to occluded septal perforator uh -huh. incidental finding yeah so um, so we we were also probably thinking about the same then i went back and looked at the literature so there are cases where you can have a jailed septal perforator uh, causing av block and those av blocks are very very uh, malignant so the reason i'll tell you so uh, blood supply to the conduction system if you take the sa node and the av node are predominantly supplied by the rca so when you have an inferior wall mi causing a, a complete heart block uh, i'll go back to the angio for the rca so the uh, inferior wall mi causing av block so your septal uh, your av nodal artery probably comes from this region this is the region where the uh, uh, posterior descending artery and the posterior lateral branches so the av nodal vessel will come here in a patient who has an inferior wall mi and av block even if he has a blockage at this point he will have av block but it's a distal part of the vessel so uh, the qu the quantity of myocardium which is injured is not great uh, in contrast so inferior wall mi causing av block is more common but uh, they are not more uh, morbid or having more mortality whereas in anterior wall mi 
I'll tell you one second. Uh, if you say take the bundle of his and the right in bundle of his 75% by the left coronary artery, 15% uh, by both. And if you take the right and the left bundle, they are exclusively supplied by the septal perforators. And if you see which septal perforator, they are usually these two. They are the first, probably this large septal perforator which supplies the proximal left bundle and right bundle. So when you have an MI which causes uh, AB block because of injury to this septal perforator means that you have an occlusion here. That is why when you have an AB block with an anterior wall MI, it's a very, very severe uh, uh, disease. You have, the patient is in hypotension. The patient usually doesn't survive. Uh, whereas in an inferior wall MI, even though it's more common, most of the patient can even recover. So this patient, I feel that the uh, uh, the jail septal perforator could have contributed. Maybe her conduction system was already diseased because of her age, and this just uh, brought out <coughs> a, a manifestation. So, but the halter was very very frightening for us, and we immediately took her, uh, and she's stable. She's fine. Uh, she's had no more episodes of syncope. We again did a left bundle pacing because she had LB dysfunction from the MI. She is fine. Sir, any, uh, you have any cases like this where you jailed a septal perforator and no, you had... No, I, I don't have, but uh, uh, I have colleagues who even have done uh, septal angioplasty in stenting. Okay, okay. They, they, they had uh, this kind of problem and they found that, you yeah, know, it was a rescue where, where Patient recovered with uh, after the stenting. Okay. Okay. Very very true, sir. Very I true. think I think your you are, your suspicions are right that this is probably related to. And another pro another uh, point. Most of when the AV node or SA node, they are relatively more uh, resistant to ischemia, be it hyperkalemia causing an AV block or ischemia. They're more sensitive. But the Purkinje fibers are very very sensitive to ischemia. They once they are injured, they the injury is long lasting. So that could be another uh, point why uh, we, we thought that it was ischemia related. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We have one question for you from yes. Dr. Jadeep Das Gupta, Kolkata. Yes, is sir. genetic analysis compulsory in all the cases of long QTS? Presenting uh, as good. Yeah, number one, uh, if you take the uh, scoring for uh, long QTS, uh, genetic analysis is in fact a part of the scoring. It helps you in. Uh, giving you a definitive diagnosis. Um, uh, number two, it helps you in uh, managing your patient. Uh, you have a patient who has a particular uh, a history, a family with a history of a child who has died and a grandparent who has died. They come to you for genetic counseling. You see just a prolonged QTC. So at least uh, because you have the three most common, so almost 80% uh, of the patients, uh, if they have a long QT, they either come in one, two, or three. So you don't have to screen for many genes. So if you have an available uh, center and you, you're suspecting congenital long QT, definitely I think you should. There are uh, specific ECG findings as uh, Javed Boss and I showed you for long QT one, two, and three. And there are certain uh, syndromic uh, associations also. You know the Javel, JL, JLN syndrome where you have deafness, uh, Timothy syndrome where you have macroscopic T-wave alternance. So I think you... Uh, when you're sending for a genetic analysis, uh, you mentioned whether it's one, two, three, or you're, you have a specific uh, a mutation in mind. It's an autosomal recessive you're looking for, uh, uh, Java, JNL, or it's autosomal dominant you're looking for, Romano Ward, or it's Timothy syndrome, then you mentioned so that the, uh, the uh, genetic analysis also becomes easy. But uh, it would definitely help. For example, long QT3, mexilitin definitely has a therapeutic role. Long QT1, uh, you have, they respond better to beta blockers and sympathetic innovation. Long QT2, pacing offers a therapeutic role because they are very, very uh, difficult patients to treat. And uh, some patients come to you at very younger age, you, you cannot offer them pacing or very aggressive treatment. Uh, but I feel that it would help uh, an analysis. Dr. Javed, you'd like to add some to Dr. Sanjay's discussion? Or else there are no questions, we will close the session. A couple, uh, just, uh, no, yeah. uh, just before closing, Sanjay, did you do a diagnostic QPS for that patient uh, where septal perforator was approved? <laughs> no, but she, oh. we, because uh, it was actually done by a colleague of me, the angioplasty. So right. we, we were um, sure that uh, she, she was in, uh, she requires a pacemaker, number one. And uh, 
diagnostic pacing we put uh, she she was extubated then we had to reintubate her i measured the hp interval because during the procedure we had a tpi the hp interval was normal it was not i think it was around uh, uh, 48 or 50 but uh, again during manipulation with the temporary pacing the pvc would cause her going into av block uh, in some uh, at some points her sinus rate in itself was at the rate of 120 but at some point just the pac or pvc would cause her av block so it was very bizarre <laughs> okay now would be would have been interesting to know what was what about va conduction was it was va conduction also same intact va conduction was i'll, I'll go through the traces boss because yesterday okay. only we had done the we case I'll, i'll go through the case probably we should close it now it's too late yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it was a very I'll very good i'll stop sharing my screen sir one, one second very good discussion and uh, dr sanjay's presentation you know it had many learning points that is what we can uh, judge from the poll uh, results also so definitely it was a great learning for uh, all of us present here and uh, i thank dr javed and dr sanjay and i hope that we'll have part 3 very soon <laughs> surely sir in the month of august we'll decide and uh, do a part 3 yeah. and we should have to decide what what topic we want to do it it should be it would be based on ecg as well we'll see sir sure yeah because, because thank you sir for always joining us and always encouraging us <laughs> it's a you find time to you always <laughs> you always find time to join us so that was that was is very you both so well that i have to be here <laughs> okay right dear thank, thank, thank you sir thank you so much sir thank you to ipka also that uh, you have arranged so well and last time we had few hassles and they they are been cleared this time yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, that's sir. Uh, yes sir so so once again sir uh, good evening to all of you on behalf of team ipka i would like to take this opportunity to thank you all uh, especially dr smith srivastava dr javed pravesh and dr sanjay vivi uh, for this wonderful and a very useful case based scientific discussion at the same time sir i must take this opportunity to thank all the participants and viewers for making this webinar successful once again thanks to all of you and we will definitely go for another series that is series 3 in the month of august as you are discussing thank you thanks to all of you sir thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir see you